Okay, perfect. So yeah, again, any questions about that or concerns, do not hesitate to let me know. I wanna make sure everybody is comfortable. Um, cool, so without further ado, hello everybody. Um, for those of you who do not know me, um, and I believe that's actually just one of you today that um, I don't believe I know. So welcome, thank you so much for being here. Um, and yeah, so my name is Olivia. I'm the South County Prevention Coordinator with Domestic Violence Services of Snohomish County. So um, just a little bit about that. I go around the community with two lovely and amazing colleagues and friends who are also on this webinar right now. Um, we talk to young people about healthy relationships, violence prevention, um, all of that really good stuff to have conversations about. And part of our job is also doing these webinars. Um, we try to do them every other week, barring any last minute changes or weird technical difficulties. Um, and these are essentially to educate the community. Anyone is welcome to log on, watch these, um, talk about any number of important topics with us. So, um, all right. So without further ado, I'll get into kind of today's, today's topic. Um, and that's gonna be friendships and relationships, well-being, that intersection of all of that stuff. It's a pretty broad topic. Um, and so hopefully we'll have like a good conversation today. Um, as usual with my webinars, if you have any comments or questions or anything, like anytime, just send it in the chat. I'm trying to keep as good an eye on it um, as I can. So if I kind of like trail off and stare into the camera, that's what I'm doing um, is looking at the chat. So, um, but yeah, I'll keep an eye on that. So if you have any questions, just interrupt me. Um, no offense taken at that. Um, so yeah, today's topic, we're gonna be talking about friendships, relationships, other kinds of relationships, how those all intersect together. Um, and of course, also as we're, we're getting into the content today, I always do wanna make sure to say that um, your safety, comfort, and well-being is my highest priority. So please take care of yourself during this webinar that hopefully should be um, relatively doable for you because this is like a virtual thing. So if anything gets tough to listen to, talk about, think about, digest, feel free to step away for a second, get some water, get some air. Um, I will not know. And even if I do, I will absolutely understand. So um, please do whatever you need to do to feel safe and comfortable as we're talking about this today. All right, so looking at today's agenda, um, we are going to, again, talk about um, the importance of friendships in general in this in the world for human beings as we all are and, and experience. Um, and typically we at DVS talk uh, mostly about intimate partner relationships, um, but we, we really do want to make sure to talk about all kinds of relationships as well. So um, friendships and specifically how they can play roles, um, as you can see here, in our other relationships, in our close, intimate or romantic relationships, how these can all, again, connect to and influence each other. That's a lot of the conversation we're going to be having today. Um, we'll also talk a bit about the way that friendships can change throughout the life course um, and why that can be important, the different kinds of ways that we might have other relationships during those parts of our lives as well. And again, how our friends can be a part of that, impact that, not impact that, what have you. We'll talk a little bit about some other um, factors that are, are related to this conversation. Um, we're going to talk a bit about loneliness and entitlement as a part of this conversation. So again, we are talking about friendships and relationships, but that's a pretty broad umbrella. Um, and so we are gonna touch on a couple other things that I at least think are relevant to having that conversation. So hopefully it should be interesting um, and engaging and, and again, hopefully relevant. We are gonna talk a little bit specifically about some of the phenomena associated with friendships, loneliness and men's experiences in particular. Um, I do think that's an important like facet to touch on in this in this conversation and, and dialogue. And then, yeah, we'll look at some of the like implications of all of this. Why does it matter? Why are we talking about it? How does it relate to us, our agency, the work that we do? And also before we dive in even more, I do wanna take a second to say that it is October in case you didn't know. Um, and that also means that it's Domestic Violence Awareness Month this month. So even better reason for you to be here today. Again, thank you so much. Um, and so this month, even especially more than ever, any useful information that you learn today in this webinar, or if you go onto our YouTube channel, if you just look up Domestic Violence Services, Snohomish County YouTube, you can find any of our other webinars from previous weeks and months on there as well. 
any useful information that, that you learn or hear about um, or kind of find on your own about DV, um, share it, share it with others, share it with your friends, your family. Um, this is again, Domestic Violence Awareness Month. month. We wanna make sure that um, word gets out in the community, that people are educated, that people can feel safe um, and, and healthy in their relationships that they're having. So with that, um, let's jump right in here. Cool, the first thing we're gonna be talking about is pretty simple. <laughs> we're just gonna be talking about friends. Why are friends so important? What are the origins of us as human beings having friendships? And again, if you have any thoughts at any time in the chat, if anything like comes to mind, you're like, oh, I've heard about this one thing. Um, I read this article once and it relates to this. Feel free to share it. Um, I love having people chime in. So that's just an open invitation. But we're gonna talk a bit about why are friends important? Why do friendships matter, right? So one of the main things that we talk about and think about particularly in our field with friendships and relationships like this is support, right? Friendships provide a very unique um, type of support that might be a kind of support that's different from ones we might get from maybe family or a partner or a professional, right? Um, friendships have this really unique and hopefully really special and, and powerful um, support power that is super important for people. Um, it's also having really important and meaningful friendships can be a, a really key way in which people find purpose and meaning in their lives. And I know that sounds like some a crazy statement. That's kind of a lot, but it is true. Um, the friendships and um, other kinds of relationships that we make with people like that, um, they do give us meaning. They give us purpose. Um, and I think that's that's really cool and really powerful. And it's a very unique relationship to look at. Um, maintaining friendships and kind of keeping up with friends, having strong and powerful and empowering friendships is also actually associated with physical health, um, physical health and longevity. It's been, it's been known and proven to, um, again, improve those physical functions as well. So I think that's a cool thing to look at too, is it's not just like, oh, great, I have friends, um, but also that's actually helping my physical health um, and helping me thrive in all kinds of ways, which is really cool. And on the more sort of mental health um, side of things, it, I think it's really interesting to note that having strong friendships, having close friendships, people that you can go to, again, go to for that support, go to to give your life that, that fullness and richness and purpose, um, that actually does boost your self-esteem um, as a person. That's something that's true. And it also works the other way, right? So if you have that higher self-esteem, then that capacity for those kinds of relationships does increase. So that's a cool kind of cycle um, of, of positivity, right? High self-esteem, close, powerful friendships. I think that's really important to note as we're having these conversations. And then just sort of from the, the evolutionary standpoint of why, why friends, right? It is kind of a unique relationship. It's kind of a, it's an interesting one, right? In the context of, okay, we have our romantic partners, we have our family that we're tied to with blood, we have um, people that we have professional relationships with. Friendships are such a unique kind of relationship. And for a lot of people, they make up a lot of their, their social life, um, what's important to them. And so we actually evolved um, to, to seek these friendships because of the benefits that come with having multiple people invested in your well-being. Multiple people that are outside of your family, that aren't just your close one partner, um, or maybe a, a person who's a professional who's being paid to take care of you. There are benefits to having more people who know what's going on in your life, who kind of can tell when something's off, maybe something's wrong, um, who know how to best support you, or at least feel comfortable asking you how they can best support you. Um, there's a lot of benefits associated with that as well. And then when we're talking about friendships and their importance in relation specifically to our other relationships, so maybe our romantic or intimate relationships with people, friends can play a huge role in this as well. One of the most important things to consider here is that the way that our the way that we perceive our friends to conceptualize our romantic and intimate relationships matters. It matters a ton, right? So if we perceive that our friends disapprove in some way of 
our partner, of our relationship, that usually has a pretty big impact. That's going to get in our heads. It's going to make us think a little bit, right? Now, in all these situations, there is, of course, the necessity to kind of discern, all right, so are they worried about me, right? Are they looking at this relationship and um, being concerned for my safety, my well-being, my health, um, the way that this person's treating me, right? Or maybe are there some other reasons that they might not be super excited about me being in this other relationship, right? We're humans, we have all kinds of complicated feelings and dynamics. Um, but the influence of friends' approval or disapproval is, is huge. Um, it's something that people tend to take into account, uh, maybe even more than they say that they would. Um, another thing that's, that's really interesting, and this is something that often comes across in like scientific studies and whatnot, but also is just true of human beings in general, is that we behave differently when we're being watched by other people. Right, it's decently simple. Um, but if we know that we're being observed, we might be more likely to influence our actions based on what we think that observer might want to see. Um, we're very conscious of how we're being perceived by other people. Um, and so, you know, if you have those friends that you know are going to be holding you to high moral standards, um, are going to be expecting you to treat other people well, as hopefully they are, right? Um, then that, that's going to be in your head, that's going to influence you, right? So having those relationships where you're not operating in a vacuum, you're not just operating just as you, but in fact, um, with all of those kind of gazes and, and um, thoughts of approval, disapproval being taken into account. And then also another thing that's super important and that we all often like to talk about, especially with young people, is the importance of friendships and these kinds of other close relationships in um, as a resource. Um, so for potentially leaving, ending, or coping with, um, if you're not ready to leave or end, a relationship that is unhealthy or even abusive. So friends can be a huge part of safety plans. Um, they can be maybe someone that you can talk to if you are experiencing abuse or other things that might be kind of scary or uncomfortable in a relationship. You might not feel comfortable going to your immediate family. You might not know if it's something that you want to talk about yet with a professional or you might not feel safe doing so um, but going to a friend might be an option that feels safe that feels comfortable and it feels realistic for you um, and then hopefully that friend knows how they can best support you um, hopefully they are understanding right of meeting you where you're at trying to get you the help that you need and want and also understanding that your choices are your own and that they are there to support you so these are some other important ways that friendships can kind of interact with relationships of specifically the, the romantic and intimate nature. Okay, so the changing nature of friendships through life. I just think this is a, kind of an interesting thing to talk about as we talk about relationships in general, um, looking at three kind of broad phases of life, childhood, adolescence, and adulthood. I'll let you all kind of think a little bit on your own about the kinds of other relationships that you have during this time, right? Maybe romantic relationships. What do those look like when you're a kid? What do those look like when you're a teenager? How do those feel when you're an adult? What might they look like? What's the same? What's different? Um, how is it perceived by the outside world, right? Like two little kids who are have a crush on each other and kind of run around and play together or, um, teens who are maybe having their first time dating someone and how is that perceived in their hearts in their minds versus how is that perceived by the outside world right we know there are some key differences there um, and then when you're an adult what kinds of romantic intimate relationships might be happening at that stage so um, looking with that in mind looking at the changing nature of friendships through these times so in childhood when you're a kid um, when you're younger you typically have, you know, when you're a really little kid, your social circle is essentially your parents, your guardians, whoever's taking care of you, hopefully raising you, right, in that hopefully nurturing environment. Um, and then as you start to get into other contexts like school and or daycare, even like teens or clubs or whatever that might be, um, right, you're starting to get socialized with other kids, other people your age. Um, so that that transition is pretty is a pretty big one. Um, and a lot of times in childhood in this phase, that, that focus um, of these kinds of really, really preliminary and exciting friendships is on just doing stuff together, right? We're having play dates, we're playing on the playground together, where um, we sit next to each other in 
daycare every day, right? It's about that that doing, being together. Um, and then you see a little bit of those transitions into shared emotions, right? Maybe when you're a little kid, you start to develop a best friend, someone that you really, really love and care about. Maybe your families are really close friends. Maybe you spend a lot of time together and eventually you start to share emotions with each other. You share experiences beyond just, I'm gonna hang out with you and go to your house. Um, there might be some actual serious emotions that, that do get shared and processed during that time, even though you are a little kid, right? You're still having those things happen in your brain. And then adolescence. So at this stage, um, this one's huge, right? Because adolescence is like the time for social connection, um, social perception, the way that other people are viewing us, the way that we're viewing other people, it's all huge at this time, right? So these connections with your friends, they deepen. Um, so it is a lot about hanging out, what are we doing together, who's there, um, social statuses, all of that stuff, but it is also about um, deep connections. There might be some disclosure happening in some of these relationships that might not be happening with other figures in these teens' lives, right? Maybe they don't feel comfortable telling uh, their parents something or their teacher, but they feel comfortable telling their best friends. Um, and then again, that support. This is a stage where we might see people actually reaching out to their friends for support first, right? That's It can be a really um, powerful group or setting in which to share things that you wouldn't feel comfortable sharing other places, especially because forming that group of friends is such an important part of identity formation at that age. And then oftentimes in adolescence, that environment that you're in, whether it's like high school or being on teams or being a part of things or being in college um, during the early parts of college, right? That's oftentimes pretty conducive to making friendships. So there's a lot of people around you, immediately around you, like within walking distance that are exactly your age that share probably a decent amount of interests, interests as you. Um, so it's a really like electric environment for friendships. And then again, that heightened importance of social interaction, um, it's huge in adolescence. So you can see how this might intersect with maybe some new emerging um, dating patterns, um, thoughts about romantic, sexual, intimate relationships at this time of life. So friendships are a huge part of that as well. Okay, and then looking at adulthood, um, so post-adolescence, this is a stage where we oftentimes see friendships actually kind of taking a backseat. So for usually the whole life up until then, um, friendships have been really central, right? When you're a little kid, forming these friends and then going to play dates, going to school, being with all your classmates, um, being in the dorms, right? Uh, being kind of surrounded by friends and having that be really, really a focal point. Now it kind of is shifting to those things are taking the backseat a little bit. They might come second to job priorities, maybe, um, to romantic relationships, whether that's dating, um, hookup scene, whether that's you're married, right? It can look a lot of different ways, but those friendships might kind of um, fall by the wayside next to those things, especially if you and your friends are separated by physical and geographic distance. Um, if, you know, after college, you all move across the country or different parts of the different parts of the world even, um, it can be literally physically harder to see them. Another thing that becomes a little bit more apparent in adulthood perhaps than in these other kind of stages is the really voluntary nature of friendships. Um, now, of course, other relationships should be hopefully both people willingly voluntarily entering into these relationships, but there's something specific about friendships that really make it um, where you are, maybe you're sitting in a, in a full lecture hall and you really see someone and you're like, hey, um, can I sit with you? Can I share your notes, right? You're really entering into those relationships um, very voluntarily. So it does make sense that when life gets busy, when jobs start cropping up, when other romantic commitments start happening, um, those things might take a backseat sometimes. And then, um, yeah, so that's kind of the, the nature of that in um, regular regular adulthood, that's a weird way to put it, but I guess like middle age, post-college, post-adolescence. Um, and then that once we enter that phase of older adulthood, so maybe like post-retirement, um, all of that stuff, then those other demands might kind of decrease. Maybe, you know, uh, those job demands, right? If you're retired, um, romantic demands for whatever reason, right? 
um, any of other kind of adult commitments that you might have, maybe some of that's been taken off your plate and you have a little bit more time now in your life to um, reconnect with old friends, make that more of a central priority again. So of course, this is not how everybody's life goes. No two people are exactly the same, but these are some patterns that do happen that I think are pretty interesting to look at and to notice um, as we're thinking about like the romantic kinds of relationships that we're having at these stages. Cool. Does anybody have, I'm gonna give like a minute just to see if anyone has questions in the chat or anything at this point before we move on. And I'm also gonna get some water. I just want to make sure I'm not talking at you relentlessly and not giving you an opportunity. So again, anytime you anything comes up, just chat it. Um, and before I move on to the next slide, I did notice that I skipped something on this slide. So I want to address that really fast. And this is just one more one more facet of adulthood friendship dynamics that I think is super interesting. Um, and that's that a lot of times making friends as an adult, maybe you're also um, Maybe you also volunteer on the same project. Maybe you are um, coworkers. So you kind of see each other naturally at these other things. Um, and while that's that's great, it's super convenient, it's awesome. It also sometimes means that that friendship making muscle can atrophy a little bit. Um, you're not necessarily thinking about it in terms of I need to go make friends. I'm gonna go make a friend on the playground right now, right? It's more of, oh, like this is handy because my, my kid's best friend's mom is really cool. So now we'll just see each other whenever our kids hang out. Um, so I think that's that's an interesting way to think about adult friendships too, um, and how that might kind of intersect with how are we having our romantic relationships? What are, what are our marriages like? Um, how often do we see each other? Do we only see each other when our kids hang out? How does that impact the level of support that we're giving, et cetera? So I just wanted to say that before I move on. Okay, so we're gonna shift gears just a teeny bit and we're gonna talk a little bit about loneliness. So loneliness is a big word. Um, a lot of things might be coming to mind. And I just wanna kind of address how I'm gonna be talking about loneliness today. And then we'll talk a bit about how it's related to all of this. So even with these little like cute pictures that I've included on this slide, um, I think that that actually gets really at how a lot of people tend to think about loneliness, which might be something like, you know, I have no friends, or I really just like don't see anyone all the time, right? That can absolutely be a part of loneliness, that physical isolation, you're feeling kind of cut off. Um, you don't really see people, maybe you don't feel like you have a lot of friends. Um, and that can be really heartbreaking and, and hard and difficult, um, or and sad. And so that can be a huge part of loneliness. But I think before I even talk about some of those other stuff, it's important to note that loneliness is perceived social social isolation. So perceived or existing so social isolation. Well, it's kind of a tongue twister. Um, and the feeling of being cut off from other people. So we can see how that that might line up really well with that, that image that we might be having of like someone being alone in their house with no friends. Um, but important that that's not always the case, right? Some people are totally content living their life that way, right? Some people have maybe a couple friends they see sometimes. Um, after a work day, they really like to just come home and have a quiet house and not really talk to anyone. And they're pretty comfortable with that, right? There are also people who might have a million connections, right? Who you might think of as um, they have a million friends, they're always doing things. That doesn't necessarily mean that they could not feel cut off from other people, right? When we're talking about loneliness, we're talking about that feeling of being cut off from people, that perceived isolation, even if it is a way that you feel inside and not necessarily reflective of how many individuals are around you all the time. Maybe you live with like 10 people, but you just don't really feel connected to any of them, right? So it's absolutely a possibility. And loneliness can be really difficult, really challenging, and, and can have some really interesting and, and sad consequences. So um, kind of like 
when we're talking about rich and empowering close friendships, loneliness can also have an impact on both mental and physical health. Um, these, these feelings of stress that are associated with, again, that perceived isolation, that feeling of being cut off, not relating to anyone, those feelings can weaken your immune system, make you more susceptible to illness, and loneliness has even been associated with premature death. Um, so I think that's super interesting. And again, it's not to say like, if you don't have enough friends, you're gonna die soon. Um, it's more about these stressors, these really real and challenging feelings of, I don't feel like I have anyone. Um, that can weigh a lot on your mental and physical health. Um, another reason that loneliness is so important to combat, such an important issue to address, is because support is so important for us human beings in our lives and in our relationships, right? So it's super important to have support when we are going through a challenging experience, whether that's in a romantic relationship or in any other kind of relationship, or even in an external thing like a job or a move or some other big life event, um, it can be so, it's, it is so important to have support there. And then also in the good times, right? You wanna have someone to celebrate with, um, someone to tell about exciting things that are happening. Those are super important things too and important not to, not to write that off. And then another reason that I think really it's really important to discuss loneliness when we are talking about friendships and relationships and the impacts that they can have on one another is the idea of perspectives. So when you're trying to make a difficult decision, um, maybe you are having feelings about breaking up with someone, you don't know, maybe you feel like you wanna do it, you're not really sure how, it's a hard, hard decision to come to. Um, that can be really important to have another perspective, an outside perspective there, someone to, again, support you through that. You can see how these are all connected. Um, maybe you're experiencing a moral dilemma. Maybe you're like, I just, I feel weird about this. I don't know, like this person's doing this thing. I'm not sure if it's right. I could really use my best friend's input on this. And then of course, for again, evaluation of behavior and of situations, both of other people and of ourselves. So we talked a little bit about how important friendships can be in helping someone either cope with or end a relationship that's unhealthy or abusive. Um, so that friend might be really instrumental in that process of, hey, um, you know, I, I don't like the way that they're treating you. Um, I think you deserve better. I think you deserve to be safe. All of that great stuff. And hopefully we also are making and keeping friends that are um, keeping us in check as well, right? Hey. I don't like the way that you're talking to your partner right now. Um, you know, I, I don't appreciate that. I don't think that's cool. And so having these perspectives can be super, super important as well. Um, when we are talking about, again, not physically how many people we're surrounded by, but more how comfortable do we feel with the people that we do have? Um, how, how much do we feel like we are connected to the people that are around us, whether that's two people or 200 people? Cool, and then the next little topic we're gonna to talk about is entitlement. Um, this one is also really, really fascinating to me. Um, and in this context, I mean, I know this word can mean a lot of things and have a lot of different um, ways in which it's used, but today we're gonna to be talking about it a little bit in terms of how can loneliness be harmful, not only to the person who is, is experiencing it and who feels lonely, but also to other individuals. Um, to a community, to a society, right? That's how we're gonna be mostly looking at entitlement today. All right, so um, when we're talking about entitlement, we are talking about an attitude, right? And usually that is a, a flawed outlook, a flawed attitude of I deserve this thing um, because of X, Y, Z reasons. Usually it has to do with superiority. It has to do with control as we'll get into in a second. Now it can get a little bit sticky because of course, as human beings, we all deserve certain things. Now this is not to take away from that, right? We all deserve love, respect, kindness, safety, equality, especially when we're talking about relationships, right? We deserve to be treated with love and respect. We deserve to have our needs be listened to and met just as equally as the next person's and the next person's. 
So those are things that we, as human beings, just because we exist, do deserve. Now we're talking about entitlement. This is something a little bit different. So let's connect it just a bit to this idea of loneliness, of feeling cut off from other people, of perceiving that um, other people maybe don't get you, that you don't have any connection with the outside world with other people. And while that can be absolutely heartbreaking and devastating for you, for this individual who's experiencing that, it can also have some consequences in society, in a community, and to other people. Um, so this is when we kind of start talking about this example of um, toxic victimhood, of really victimizing yourself and saying, well, you know, no one understands me, therefore I have a lot of anger. I'm experiencing, um, or I'm holding this, this dangerous attitude of entitlement. You need to treat me like this. You need to do this for me. You need to listen to me. You can see how those attitudes can start to shift really dangerously easily from, hey, I'm a person who deserves love and respect, and I'm going to go find some people who will treat me with love and respect, to, oh, you're not treating me exactly how I want. Um, you're not doing exactly what I say, therefore um, X, Y, Z thing, right? It can be kind of dangerous. And so one really, really extreme example of this that I believe my lovely friend Annie is going to do a webinar on, I think at some point, um, so I won't talk about it too much because she's done a whole lot of research on this, but a really powerful example of toxic entitlement is incel culture. So if you haven't heard of this, um, involuntary celibates, it's a very um, dangerous ideal, dangerous toxic group um, of, of it's a toxic attitude held by groups of men, particularly online, um, that has to do a lot with entitlement around women, women's attitudes, women's bodies, the way that they should be treated um, by women. And yeah, Annie says, woohoo. Yes, I'm excited for this webinar, Annie. Still, still waiting for it. Can't wait. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so this, this um, particular instance of entitlement is really, really dangerous and really scary. Um, because again, it takes, it, it embodies that shift from, hey, I deserve to be treated well. And I would like you to treat me with respect. And if you're not going to, then I'm going to remove myself from this relationship because this isn't, this isn't good for me. Um, those healthy attitudes, it embodies that shift from that to kind of, if you aren't treating me exactly how I want to be treated, then I'm going to spite you. I'm going to hurt you, right? You deserve to suffer because of that. Um, and so some of the key parts of this incel culture are, again, that need for recognition, that moral superiority piece. So I um, I am a god, I am the best, and you all don't even know how to exist. You don't know how to treat people. Um, I'm morally above everybody here. Um, that really dangerous attitude. A lack of empathy and rumination. Rumination on those events where maybe someone didn't treat you exactly how you wanted to be treated. And instead of kind of taking that in the context of life and in the context of human behaviors and interactions, it's something that constantly gets ruminated um, constantly gets kind of looped back to um, and, and is used to formulate these really dangerous attitudes about other people. And then of course, when we're talking about entitlement, we are talking about power and control. This is something that we talk about almost with almost every single topic relating to domestic violence and unhealthy relationships. At the center of it all is power and control. So this particularly comes into play when we are talking about entitlement centered around another person, right? I am entitled to your time. I am entitled um, to you doing exactly what I say. I'm entitled to your obedience, your submission, right? Those are very different sentiments than, hey, I deserve respect, right? Um, and, you know, I'm entitled to your body. That is another huge one. That's physical, it's dangerous, it's terrifying, um, and it's unfortunately very real. So these are some of these, these dangerous attitudes that can be held around that. But we see that overlapping a lot with possession, right? I, I am allowed to control you because X, Y, Z reason. I have a right to say where you can go, who you can talk to, how exactly how the words that you use when you're talking to me, et cetera. Cool. Anyone have any questions, comments at this point? We're almost wrapping up here, but.
there is a car honking outside. Hopefully you can't hear that. Cool. Um, yeah, if you're still typing, feel free to keep doing that. If not, all good. Um, at, before we start to do our wrap up here, I do want to touch a little bit on the phenomena of friendships, loneliness, and men in particular. Now, this is not to say um, that only men are going to experience things like this, that only men are capable of violence and dangerous attitudes. Unfortunately, we do know that anyone can enact violence. Anyone can experience violence. Um, that being said, though, there are some specific things that have actually happened, especially in recent years regarding men and friendships that I think have some really powerful, scary, and also interesting implications for relationships, safety, and community. So there, some of you might have might be familiar um, with the idea of the friendship recession that's actually happening in the US over the last couple of years, and especially with the pandemic, that definitely did not help anyone's loneliness or friendships, I don't think. Um, but particularly for men, um, they've been affected the most by this friendship recession. So that's how many close friends would you would you say that you have, right? How close do you feel to your friends? How much do you feel like you can go to them for support? All of those numbers have been declining in recent research. So again, men have really been, been impacted the hardest by this. And this is due to a couple of different factors. Um, a lot of men have been actually moving back in with their parents um, in their adult life, which of course that in and of itself, like no judgment, people live their life in whatever way works for them. But this has been shown to be connected to, um, as is to be expected, a little bit harder time making friends, um, doing, doing those kinds of friendship making things in the world, um, if that's your living context. And then different changes in workplaces. So maybe not going into the office as much, not going to see people at work. Um, this probably also has a lot to do with COVID and pandemic changes. And then of course the huge one is socialization. So the way that we socialize um, men and young boys um, growing up to suppress their emotions, um, to not be vulnerable with friends, to not share, um, express love and care and tenderness with their friends. Um, the way that that has been taboo and kind of cautioned against for, for young men um, does not bode well for them in their adult life in terms of this, this friendship recession, this drought that we see happening. And we're talking about men's interactions with their friends. So again, men are much less likely to be emotionally vulnerable with their friends, to express to their friends that they love them. Um, that number is much, much lower for men than women. And one in five single men report they have no close friendships. So I just want to kind of let that sit there for a second. Um, one in five feels like a really big number to me. And this is the stat that actually inspired this whole webinar. Um, I, I had a friend read an article to me where she, she told me this like earlier this year. And I kind of, you know, I was, I was at work at the time and I kind of stopped in my tracks and I was like, that's terrifying. Um, it's A, it's really sad for these one in five men. Um, but to me, my kind of DVS brain was like, that's really scary. That scares me because we know how people behave as we've just talked about for the last 45 minutes. We know how people behave when they feel cut off from other people, when they feel alone, misunderstood, um, you know, when they feel taken advantage of. We can see how those, those attitudes, that hurt can shift into really, really dangerous outlooks and entitlement. Um, and so hearing that stat about one in five men reporting no close friendships kind of spooked me a little bit. And so that's kind of the, that was the brainchild for this, um, this webinar. And then just, I think this is kind of just interesting, the evolution of men's friendships with other men. Um, so it actually hasn't always been taboo or bad um, societally for men to have close, vulnerable, emotional, um, and love-filled, tender friendships with other men. Um, I know like the founding fathers, that was like a big part of their culture. Um, it only became taboo around the second half of the 20th century in particular um, with changing ideas of masculinity for one thing and also rise in homophobic sentiments. So those things combined made for this really toxic environment in which, um, yeah, close male, male friendships became very taboo. Now in more recent years, um, we have seen like bromances become a little bit more destigmatized, um, become a bit more of, of a part of pop culture even. 
Um, and so that's been really good. And it also has been shown in um, other surveys and research that a lot of men do feel, um, and I believe this was research done on men who were in relationships with women, um, that their male friendships are more satisfying to them emotionally than their relationships with their wives or girlfriends or partners. Um, so that's a whole other unpack. That could be a whole other webinar, but I do think that's that's really interesting to share as well. Again, just importance of friendships can't be overstated. Cool, so looking at some implications of this as we're heading into the 45 minute mark here, um, I just wanna talk a little bit about why. Why spend 45 minutes talking about this? Why talk about friendships for so long? So many different words have, were thrown out today, loneliness, entitlement, value systems, right? Friendships, relationships. Um, so just kind of want to talk about it all and wrap it up before we close out here. So the implications for violence, right? We do know that men who feel, who are strongly influenced by um, gender roles that they report to feel suffocating, these men are seven times more likely to use physical violence and two times more likely to have suicidal thoughts. So this is kind of where we, this is the, the stat that I tend to direct people to when um, explaining the phrase, right? The patriarchy hurts everybody, right? And we're talking about these gender roles, um, these really stifling attitudes. We tend to think of them oppressing women, oppressing non-binary people, which is absolutely true. Um, but we also wanna think about, hey, you know, this isn't good for men either, right? We don't want men who are, seven times more likely to use physical violence who are going to use violence on themselves, right? That's not good, that's not healthy. Again, that entitlement attitude, entitlement to power, control, entitlement to sex. Um, again, looking back at that incel culture, that really, really dangerous um, kind of online culture, entitlement to superiority over women, over partners, over children, over anyone, right? And then again, that, that toxic victimhood, right? going from, hey, I feel kind of sad, um, I don't really feel very connected to anyone, to the world hates me, so I hate the world back, and I'm going to do a violent act, right? So those are some pretty pretty scary, pretty chilling implications. But I do want to end on a, a more positive note, right? The implications for safety. Friendships are so important as support systems. We talked about this earlier, um, friendships in safety planning, friendships in support, friendships in disclosure. These are all huge in talking about abusive relationships, but also just anything that happens in the world. Again, having an outside perspective. So someone to be like, hey, I don't think this is normal. Or, hey, I think you deserve to be treated better. Or, hey, you need to not treat that person like that. That's not cool. Um, so that kind of gets into, again, this third bullet point, checks on behaviors and actions. And then important for combating loneliness and isolation, right? Even these implications for violence aside, we don't want people feeling lonely. We don't want people feeling isolated, cut off and misunderstood um, because no one deserves to feel like that at the end of the day. So wanna make sure that we know friendships are super vital in combating that. All right, so that pretty much wraps it up. I wanna take a second to um, make you stare at all of these links that I have here. <laughs> um, a lot of research and a lot of other people's really cool hard work went into this, so I want to credit them all. Um, and again, this will be on YouTube in a few days. So if you want to look more at this, please feel free. Um, and yeah, that's it. That's all I have for you today. So thank you so much again for being here. If you have any questions, please reach out to this email. Um, we monitor it very closely and you will be hearing back from us. So don't hesitate. Um, and then of course, of course, if you do need um, immediate assistance, so if you're worried about yourself, if you're worried about someone that you care about, if you just have some questions that you want answered, um, please feel free to reach out to our support line. This is 24 hours, um, totally confidential, totally free. That's 425-25-ABUSE um, or 425-252-2873. So without uh, anything else, I think that's all I have for you. Um, thank you so much again. If you have any questions, I'll hang out for a couple more minutes, but have an awesome rest of your Friday.